Thank you for visiting my garden today. I'm Liz Davey, and you're watching A Walk in the Garden on Norfolk Community Cable Television, NCTV. We're in the garden, but it doesn't look much like a garden today because it's only early February, and nothing much is growing yet, but there are still some things you can do out in the garden when you do have a clear, nice day. Right now, we don't have any snow cover, so I try to get out when I can and walk around the garden a little bit and see what's happening. Uh, I'm at my herb garden right now. Most of my herbs are covered with oak leaves, which will give them a little protection, but those leaves will come off in the spring. We're just gonna leave them alone for now. One of the things I can do right now during this season is to pick up sticks. And we have plenty of those thanks to a number of wind storms that we've had. We've had some rain and with it came some wind. And if you have trees and you have wind, you probably have branches on the ground. Uh, right now I'm gathering them up. Later on, we will burn them. Uh, Norfolk does allow open burning for a specified period and burning permits will be available soon if they aren't now by uh, contacting and visiting the fire department in Norfolk to get a permit. You are not allowed to open burn without a permit in Norfolk. So you need to have the permit and then on a day that you wish to burn, you need to call and see if burning is allowed that day. You need to find a spot that's a goodly distance from the house and have water ready and tools ready in case the fire gets out of hand. Uh, it is also possible to take your items over to the transfer station where they will be chipped up for chips. So there are several options to get rid of all these branches you're picking up. The other thing I can do right now is uh, reinforce my deer spray. The deer are around and they are still hungry and they are eating and anything that I think might be vulnerable to deer, I will spray with the spray. And that would include azaleas and some evergreens. You know what causes the damage in your yard and you do need to reinforce the spray every once in a while, even though it's winter. I try to pick a day when it's above freezing. Today, I think it's about in the 40s, maybe a little less. Uh, it feels a little cold because we do have a little breeze, but you can get out and use the deer spray and it will discourage them. By using it continually or very early in the season, you do discourage some of the deer. They'll find other ways to go. And that's exactly what you want. You want them to stay out of your yard and stay in the woods. <laughs> Again, there's not much to be done in the herb garden now. We'll trim some of these things back later, but right now they just stay put. It would be possible if you needed some sage to come out and pick a little. And uh, you could probably also pick some of the times. They are evergreen, so they could be picked and used if you really need some. And, but not much else is going on. Uh, I always hate to see the herbs go in the fall, and I'm anxious to have them return in the spring so that I can have some fresh herbs for cooking. It's also the time for seed catalogs and all of the garden centers online have got their new web pages up with all their 2018 flowers and plants that you can order. Order your things early, including seeds, because they do run out and you don't want to go and find a favorite, uh, perhaps cannabob, and find that out of stock list when you go to try to order it. So order anything that you might need now. They don't necessarily ship these plants now, especially the tender plants, but they will ship them at the appropriate time for planting in your area. So it's a good thing to get your orders in and they often won't even charge your account until the plants are mailed. So make your plans now. If you did make a garden journal last year and wrote down those places that you need new plants and what you might want to put there, you'll have a good start on your ordering process. If there were snow when I'm outside, I would be looking for tracks. That's one way to tell what garden pests you might have in the garden. I know now that I need to be careful to spray down low 
not just deer th things, but things for rabbits, because I've seen a number of rabbit tracks in the snow. If you don't know what the tracks look like when you find them, you can always go online or to some of the books at the library or maybe in your own collection and see what critters are coming into your yard. It's kind of interesting. I've identified squirrels, birds, rabbits, and some other canines, which may be neighbor's dogs, or it might be coyotes, but at any rate, it's some sort of dog relative. And of course, the deer tracks, they're pretty distinctive. It's fun to see what you might have, especially if you live near water, you may find uh, muskrat and other things like that. Now let's move over to the perennial garden. Things are pretty gray in the perennial garden, uh, except for something like the red twig dogwood. And you can see it adds a lot of color in the winter. Uh, I've also left some perennials standing, the sedums, and there's some flocks that still had some seeds on it that I thought the birds might enjoy. On a really nice day, some of those can be pruned. I'm not gonna prune this dogwood down too much. I'll probably take about a third of the stalks out of it. And they may be something you can use for indoor decorations or even in a flower pot outside later on. So you might want to save these bright red stems. One of the reasons to grow this type of dogwood is these colorful stems in the winter. The baskets are still on the chrysanthemums, the lavender, and some of the other more tender perennials. They have oak leaves in them, a rock on top. Uh, again, I check those and make sure that they haven't been tipped over and, or the rock fallen off uh, so that it would blow away. Some of the things I cleaned up this fall as far as foliage, uh, if you have a nice day and it's not too muddy, you can get out and start cutting back some of the perennials if you really want to. It's not necessary but it gives you a little head start on the spring cleanup when you'll be cleaning out these beds of all the old perennial foliage. Bulbs will be coming up in another month, month and a half, and then at that point you'll want to have all this old foliage out of there. But I like to leave it, particularly the sedums, anything that's standing tall for winter interests. It looks very pretty when the snow's on it, and you can just give a, get the garden a little bit of texture that it wouldn't have if you just stripped everything off now. The seeds are pretty much gone, however, from any of the uh, perennials that you left for the birds. Uh, however, some of the insects that uh, overwinter in these things are still there. So I probably won't be cutting too much. I want the beneficial insects to stick around. We want those that are beneficial to take care of those that aren't. So. It's good to leave some of the things standing a little bit longer. I'm going to move over here. I have a holly over here, and it's time right now that you can prune the holly. And this I'll just cut back. Again, pick a nice day. You've got the rest of February to get the job done. So we've had some nice days on and off, and those are the times to use. And I'll just cut this back a little bit. Particularly any stems that are uh, browned or winter killed. Our coldest weather this year happened when we did have snow cover, and that's, that's good. Uh, holly will put on quite a bit of growth each season. I have some that's winter killed here, We'll get that off. And just, in general, shape the plant up a little bit more. And add our clippings to the burn pile. Another thing you can do in the off season is sharpen your clippers. Uh, these can be sharpened with a stone there are directions that come with them for sharpening them. You can certainly find it online if you go to your clippers website, if you have good clippers. Uh, the other thing you can do with these is replace the blades. I think I'm about ready for a blade replacement 
given the number of chips that are in the blades. Uh, it's always good to have sharp pruners. They are a lot easier to use and the sharper cuts are better for the plants too. The vegetable garden is still pretty wet so I'm not even going to go in and step on it. I don't want to compact the soil unless I need to. Uh, we want to keep it kind of fluffed up. I've got uh, straw in certain areas over the garlic we planted in the fall and over some parsley and some kale that were left during the season. Uh, they may or may not come back. We'll see. Strawberry plants have been ordered. I removed the strawberries from last year. They had kind of reached the end of their lifespan. About every five years I like to replace them with new berries and the new berries will come probably in April, early April, and we can plant the, a row or two of those as they arrive. Again, I will be doing some planting so I know where I want to plant them. I don't want to plant them where they were planted the year before or the years before. So we'll pick a new spot for the strawberries to be planted this year. I do have my plan from last year and I use that to make a plan for this year so that no crop is in the exact same place where it was the year before. That helps prevent a lot of insect damage, though not necessarily all of it because the garden is only, a, I don't have separate fields for different crops so I can't rotate that much, but I try to rotate them as much as possible. Now let's just step into the back a little bit and then we can go inside. I've removed most of my Christmas decorations, but these uh, pots of greens, I use large, my large containers I fill with greens and berries and, and some of the red twig dogwood and a little bit of the sedum and other things. Well, I can't take this apart because they're frozen in. They don't come out at all. I'll know it's spring when I can pull out these evergreen pieces and put them in the burn pile as well. Uh, so I have three large pots and two window boxes that will stay for quite a long time. Actually four large pots and so they just will continue. I did uh, remove any small decorations that would come out uh, such as Christmas balls and Christmas lights. Those I can take out but I have to leave whatever is frozen into the ground so we know it's still winter underneath even though there's no snow on the ground today but there is hope for spring let's come back this way one of the earliest blooming plants in my garden are the hellebores and you can see that they're already putting up new shoots these are really early 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 and they aren't damaged too much by snow but you can see that the blooms are starting to come up. A little later on, probably in another month, I will cut back some of the old foliage because once they bloom, they will make new foliage. And this foliage is getting pretty battered uh, by the snow and bad weather. And also me walking through the garden, no doubt. But you can see that the, the new sprouts are coming up of this plant. So there is hope for spring. We know it's coming. It's just going to take a little longer because it's only February and early February at that. My garden shed, I usually uh, have a path to it because some of the seeding supplies that I use inside are stored there. The pond is frozen over. Uh, it will stay that way. And when it does thaw a little bit, I do see tracks up to it. Some of the uh, animals in this area do use it for water although there is a brook further out that I think is more popular because it continues to run. I can use the house on sunny days. On a real sunny day, the temperature, even if it's 30 outside, will be up to 80 in that shed because of the uh, plexiglass side wall window that faces south. However, at night, when the sun goes down, the temperature falls about to the same temperature as the outdoor area, so I really can't grow plants in there in the winter. It would be nice if I could, but uh, for that I have to grow them inside. In the spring and fall I can extend the season a little bit there, but uh, it really gets as cold as it does hot, so it has a very uneven temperature. and Things would try to grow and then be killed with a cold snap. Let's go inside now and see what we can do to do some early planning for spring 
and some seasonal decorations and a Valentine's dinner for two. Are you ready to plant tomatoes? Don't, it's too soon. <laughs> Things uh, that are seeded inside, if you start them too early, just get really leggy and then they're set back when you put them outside. So you wanna start uh, tomatoes, peppers, and a lot of the other crops later on. February, early February, late January is way too early. Unless you uh, have, have a really good greenhouse to put them into, but they will still be too leggy if you start them now. We'll start those in another month or, or even two months. Uh, we can't set things like that outside until after our frost date, after no danger of frost. And for us in zone, I believe it's six now instead of five, used to be five, now I believe we're 6A, and that runs about May 15th, somewhere around May 10th to 15th. You can be sure that you can set things outside after that date. It's uh, important not to get things out too early or they may be frost killed. And a lot of the plants we do set out in our gardens are frost sensitive. As you know from past years, in the fall they are killed by a frost and they will be killed by a spring frost if you set them out too early. But there are some things we can do inside and we can start some seeds outside of perennials. Today I have been busy with some of the cuttings that I took last fall. They've done pretty well. I haven't lost too many of them. I've been repotting them. This is one of the geraniums that I repotted. Remember we did a lot of geranium cuttings. This one we could almost do another cutting on this plant because it's put on so much foliage. Uh, I have put this into its own pot. Uh, I started out with three geraniums per pot. Like I have the three plectoranthus in this one and they formed some pretty good roots and now they need some fresh soil. So I have some potting soil. Which you can get at garden centers. And what I'll do is put a little in each of three little larger pots. and then carefully break these plants up, trying to get a good root structure on each one. And just pull them apart. And then add fresh soil. If you've given your house plants a vacation from fertilizer, for the winter, which is a good idea. Uh, you can start fertilizing them again. And especially these cuttings, as the days grow longer, they will uh, start putting on some good growth. And they'll need a little extra. You want to fertilize perhaps at half strength to start using a liquid fertilizer inside. So you just basically give each of these nice plants, spread out their roots and some nice fresh soil. And again, this is just potting soil. And I do put the cuttings in the pots, various pots, on trays that don't leak, hopefully and then I can water these and we'll give them a good drink. And let me get some of this dirt out of the way. And this uh, soil that was already used is going to go back into the compost pile rather than back into the, to be used again. It's been pretty much depleted by those uh, cuttings that have grown up in it. The next thing I want to do is plant some perennial seeds outdoors and to do that I'm going to make a little greenhouse for them. I'm going to start with an empty water jug or milk jug and poke holes in the top and bottom. I'm 
you want it to drain and you want it to also pick up some rainfall. And we're going to leave the cap off. And I'll, then I'll put one good hole in the side and then use my scissors. These are a pair of kitchen scissors that I have relegated to garden use. And I'm cutting this around about a third of the way up. And I'm going to leave about a half an inch when I get around to where I started for a hinge. So I have a hinge on this. And this is going to be a little greenhouse. Now for this I'm going to use a different soil and this is a germinating soil. And you can see that it's quite a bit finer than the uh, potting soil that I used before. It also is a very light soil. And we'll need a little more of that to cover. And this time I'm going to plant some Gloriosa daisies. And this is an annual daisy uh, that will reseed, perhaps. And these are seeds that were saved by a friend last year. And I just am going to very carefully spread these out as much as I can. I'm going to cover them with a tiny bit of soil. Really not much at all because they're a fairly small seed. Let's see we got a few more in here too. Sprinkle those in. It's fun to save seeds we did that last fall, and now I'm planting them. You may have noticed as we were out in the garden, all of these empty milk, or not empty milk cartons, empty of milk, but full of soil and plants. Then I've labeled, put a label in, which says Gloriosa Daisy. Then I'm going to use a piece of masking tape. Just one. To fasten this shut opposite the hinge. And then I'm going to label it again. Sometimes these wear off and sometimes the stick does. So. Now this is going to go outside and it's going to sit in the back of my garden and I'm going to forget about it. And I'm not going to do a thing. I'm not going to water it. I'm not going to open it. Uh, for several months it will just sit. And this will give the seeds a chance to act like they are, had been dropped by the plants last fall and are in the wild. And hopefully in about April, I can look in and see little green coming up. And if we have some really warm days in April, I can remove the tape a little bit and open them up on a sunny day. Uh, if it gets really, really, really dry, when it gets warmer, I can add a little water. But generally, they do just fine on their own, just sitting out in the garden. I've started probably 12 different perennials that way. And yes, not all of them will grow. There will be some that probably won't, depending on how the seeds were uh, done. But uh, generally, they do really well this way, and it's so much easier than trying to keep track of them inside, where you do have to give them artificial light and water. Uh, we let Mother Nature do the germinating on these. Next month, I'll be starting some long growing annuals, the ones that take a long time to germinate. And I start those under lights that I have over here. I have some of my cuttings under the lights right now, but I'll be moving the other things over. But enough of uh, plant germinating. 
Now I need something to hang up by my door. And since Valentine's Day is on the way, I thought I'd make a couple Valentine arrangements. And I have this heart-shaped wreath that I got a number of years ago. I've used it for several different holidays. I've put lilies on it for Easter several years in a row. But this year I'm going to make a Valentine decoration with it. And I've got some uh, silk flowers. And these are just an assortment of leftover silk flowers, or you can buy new ones. And I'm going to wire those with a piece of wire. And we'll wire the stems together two or three times around. And twist it. Obviously, you can't put fresh flowers outside yet, but I will just uh, wire this then onto the wreath. I think we've got enough to go around again. And then we want to put a nice red bow on it. And this is uh, some Valentine ribbon from the craft store. And again, we'll just wire that around. And Make sure it's tight and we have our streamers hanging down. And this is ready to go outside and hang by my front door as a seasonal decoration. And then we need some inside decorations too. And I have a pitcher. And I've sprayed some sticks white. This is about the easiest decoration you could possibly make. Uh, these are just sticks that I cut, actually cut or picked up from outside and spray painted them. And then I'm just using some red stickers on them. And these are, I take two. And put one on one side and one on the other. And we're going to try to get them even. And pinch them around the branch. There are quite a few on each of the sheets, so it's pretty easy to do. Put a few more on. And then another one that we can do is, let's see if I find a spot for that, is using some fresh flowers. And I've picked uh, just uh, chrysanthemums that were fresh at the store. I've put them in a large container with the uh, powder, uh, preserving powder that came with them and put them in quite a lot of water. But now I'll be cutting them and putting them into the uh, floral foam that I've soaked and put into a small flower pot. I also got some baby's breath to use as filler. Fresh baby's breath. And when this is finished, you can dry it. So you can use it again as a dried flower. So we'll just kind of cut this one into pieces and poke it into the foam. And I may have enough for more than one arrangement. 
with these flowers. However, they often come in packages. So unless you select individual stems, And maybe I might as well use it all. And then we'll cut some of the individual stems to put in. few a little longer. Let's see, I think the clippers will work better for these. I don't do too well working backwards, but See how we're doing here. We need more of each. Some more red here. The main trick to arranging flowers is to remember that if you change the position of the flowers, for instance, if I put uh, this red flower in and decide I don't like where it is, then I would have to recut the stem in order to put it back. Once it goes into that foam, it seals the end and it won't take up water. So again, I would want to recut before I put it in. And I need a few more whites in here at this side. Red here. Maybe we will use all of them in this this arrangement. And probably another red down here. We need to cut that again to get it down in front. And there we have a nice combination arrangement, and we can put these together on our dining table a little later. And we lost one of our hearts, but they can be put back on really easy. So you have to make sure they're pinched tight. Now let's go into the kitchen and see what we can cook up for a nice Valentine's dinner for two. Today we're going to make a couple of items for a nice dinner for two for Valentine's Day. It seems appropriate. Valentine's Day it often snows, so you may as well plan to stay in instead of going out because you may stay in anyway if the weather's bad. At least that's what's happened in my life. And uh, I'm going to start by softening some gelatin. I've already softened it in a tablespoon of water. This is uh, unsweetened, unflavored gelatin, just plain gelatin. It's uh, not, not something you'd want to eat for a meal, but it does help thicken up other things. And I've used just one teaspoon of it in one tablespoon of water. And now I'm going to add two tablespoons of boiling water.
and I'll stir that to dissolve the gelatin and it will turn completely clear when it's already dissolved. You want it dissolved, you don't want big chunks of gelatin in your finished product. And this is how you do it. Now if you sit, let this sit too long before proceeding to another step, it will solidify. So that's another thing you don't want to happen before you're finished with your recipe. There we are, nice and clear and completely dissolved. What we're going to be making is a chocolate mousse for dessert. And this recipe calls for a half cup of sugar, a quarter of a teaspoon of unsweetened cocoa powder, one cup of heavy cream, and we'll get all that cream out. teaspoon of vanilla, and I'll stir this up a bit. Again, we can uh, use the spatula to just stir it around a bit. Incorporate most of the cocoa if we can. At least get it moistened. Otherwise, it, when you tend to use the beater, it will start flying out of the bowl. And that's all, not always a good scene in the kitchen. And I'm going to use my electric beater and mix it until it stiffens. My next step is going to be to add the softened gelatin to this stiffened mixture and continue to beat it a little bit more. And again, we can scrape down the sides a little bit.
And this is our chocolate mousse. I'm going to spoon that into some uh, dessert dishes. This makes four servings with the one cup of cream. But I'll just I'm only going to use two of them tonight tonight for my dinner. So the other two can go into the refrigerator to set and be used another time. In fact, refrigerating this now for an hour will help it set up even more. Did we slight somebody? Maybe a little bit. A little more. Okay, now let's garnish that a little bit with some chocolate curls, which are pretty easy to make. If you have a bar of semi-sweet chocolate and your vegetable grater, you can just grate a little of it. I'll go down the side here. Well, this isn't really a curl, it's uh, some shreds. If you do go the long way on a, a large piece of this, it can make more curls. We save our chocolate for another time. And that's our dessert, one of our desserts for the evening meal. I'll just put these over out of the way while I do some more cooking and clear off my work area a little bit of the chocolate. I've made some cookies, uh, just plain cookies and I'm going to finish decorating them. Some of them after I frosted them with just the white frosting I added uh, colored sugar and that's kind of a traditional way to do it, a quick way. I just used a uh, traditional sugar cookie recipe or you could use the purchased sugar cookie recipe but you can decorate them a little more if you still have white frosting left, which I did. And what I'm going to do, I'm doing this backwards again is interesting, I'm just going to make some little stems and I think I need to get, a, there we are. And some branches. These are kind of a make some branches and then I'm going to just add some little red heart decorations. Probably five or six for each cookie. And I'll do another another one that way as well. Can add little branches and curly cues. I like the white on white look with just the touch of red. Oops. Mm, 
put one right in the middle. So there's two, two more little cookies. And uh, another way that you can do it is just to put a bit of frosting in the middle and add one large heart. They come in different sizes, so you can uh, match them to whatever you want to do. So we have a few cookies to go with our chocolate mousse. Now it's time to make a main dish. And what I'm going to make for my main dish is an old-fashioned recipe, at least it's old-fashioned now. It's very popular back in probably 50 years ago. And uh, I was around then, so I did make it. And what I'm going to make is a beef stroganoff. And I'm heating up two tablespoons of butter, and I have thinly sliced beef uh, sirloin, and I have a two tablespoons of flour and a half teaspoon of salt that I'm going to mix in with that meat right now as my two tablespoons of butter melts and the uh, pan heats up. And I'm just going to mix this to kind of coat the meat with a little of the flour and salt. When I first got married, this was kind of my go-to company dish. And it's still good, and it's fairly fast to make. And it tastes good, so. And I'll melt the butter and stir it around a little bit. We want the pan fairly hot for this. Now I'll add the, the meat to the pan and spread it out. And we're going to brown this meat quickly as we can. If you uh, do cook with gas, it probably would be a little faster. You can also do this in a chafing dish if you have sterno. I have a chafing dish, but I was out at, don't have any sterno, so I'm doing it on the stove. Anyway. But it was a great chafing dish type meal that you could cook table side. And we're going to quickly brown this.
pretty well browned and now I'm going to add a half a cup of onion and one clove of garlic. It's been chopped, the onion's chopped, the garlic is minced quite finely. And one cup of sliced mushrooms. And we're going to stir that around for a couple minutes. Now I'm going to remove the meat and the mushrooms to another dish. Some of the onions will come with them, and a few may stay. We're going to remove these. Turn down the heat a little bit. I'm going to add these back in later. And the last piece there. And I'm going to add two more tablespoons of butter to the pan. And melt that. And add mushroom. Then I'll add three tablespoons of flour and mix that with the butter. And a tablespoon of tomato paste, which uh, I have in a tube rather than a can. Otherwise you end up with half a can of tomato paste. And that makes a nice roux. And I'll add one and a quarter cups of beef broth. And stir it around to mix it. I'll stir that around until it comes to a boil and thickens.
and it is there. Now we're going to add the meat back in and the mushrooms. And heat it back up. Just pretty well done. And two more ingredients to go. That would be uh, one cup of sour cream. And two tablespoons of sherry after the sour cream is mixed in. Let's do that first. And we really don't want to necessarily boil it at this point, just to heat it slightly. Again, it's a very creamy dish. Now the two tablespoons of sherry to finish it. Let's see. And we'll mix that in. And heat it just a bit. going to put it in my chafing dish to serve it. It's heated now and we can pour it into this dish so we can keep it hot. Let's take it in to the dining room to serve our romantic dinner for two. I'll see you there. Here we are in the dining room ready for dinner. I've added a few things to the menu. We have the beef stroganoff which I'll serve over buttered noodles along with some fresh green beans and a simple salad of fresh, fresh spring greens with some uh, blue cheese and wa toasted walnuts and I'll use a balsamic vinaigrette on that salad, uh, a little alfa bread, our beef stroganoff, of course, and then for dessert, the chocolate mousse with some Valentine's cookies. Wishing you a happy Valentine's Day. And this is Liz Davy, and you're watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV. Hope to see you again next time when we'll visit the garden again and do a little more cooking.